live from Boston, Massachusetts. It's The Cube at the HP Vertica Big Data Conference 2014. Brought to you by HP. With your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone here live in Boston, Massachusetts for the HP Vertica Big Data Conference. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signals and noise. Our next guest is Colin Mahoney, GM of HP Vertica. Welcome back to theCUBE uh, again. Thanks, John. Yeah, um, great it's keynote. good to be here with you guys. Great Thank keynote you. up there you guys had Appreciate today. It. Great conference, packed house. Uh, again, just last year again was the inaugural event. Yep. This year, still packed, great names. Give us the take on what's, what the event's all about here. What's the vibe? So uh, the vibe is great. Uh, you know, the numbers are up again. Uh, this is our second show, as you mentioned. And for us, it's, um, it's probably a slightly different show than what most people are accustomed to. We really want it to be about the people, and specifically our customers and our partners, uh, and sharing information with one another about data. As you guys know, this industry is evolving very rapidly. It uh, is a fairly complicated industry. There's all sorts of challenges that people are trying to solve. And so we've, uh, in, in working the agenda of the conference, we've really allotted a lot of time for folks to uh, network, for them to talk to one another. Uh, and then also, you don't hear a lot from a marketing perspective at all from us. This is really about our technical engineers and practitioners sharing their knowledge, how things work, learning from our customers and partners. So it's, it's intimate, it's grown a lot since last year, but it's still intimate. And uh, we're back here in Boston, it's a great time. Yeah, it's great, here. we got our cube list is a lot of uh, customers. And it seems to be that be the big theme. And Jeff Kettle was just pointing out that he predicted you know, three years ago that the big growth and the, the billions that he sized up was going to come from not so much the vendors, but the output of the ecosystem being the practitioners, the deployment of big data, the use of big data. Yep. Uh, funny story, last night I was welcome back from Legal Seafood uh, here in Boston, beautiful night. Um, and I saw uh, a guy um, from uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, a customer. And I asked him, he was here for the event, and we just, I just bumped into him randomly, and he said, I'm here to learn more about the Columnar store, and he's coming from an ETL background. Yep. And, he's, and I asked him, so are you shifting? He goes, absolutely, we're shifting over. We see Hadoop, we see these new technologies as transformative, and I'm here to learn. Is that a, a consistent thing that you're hearing, that people are here to learn? And, and what percentages are, do you see in terms of uh, vertical success, here to learn versus I'm driving the Ferrari of Columnar store, high-end performance? What's the percentage of in production versus I'm here to learn? of your base? There, uh, there are, there's a high number of production customers here, but I'd say even with production customers, they still want to learn. Uh, you know, even it, just because you're in production doesn't mean you're using all the features and the capabilities. Our platform changes. We just uh, came out with uh, another uh, major release. And so I think there's a constant learning that goes on even when you're in production. And some people will start out and they'll do, let's speed up our traditional enterprise data warehouse or let's speed up our traditional reporting. But then they'll start getting into A-B testing or they'll start to get into deep data science work. And that's part of the power of a platform um, especially the broader Haven platform, but whether it's Vertica or Idle or it's Haven, you can start tacking, tack, adding things on to what you already do. And so I think there's a good mix. So you mentioned in your keynote, if you go back to, it must have been like what, 2007, 2008, Vertica was essentially a feature company, yeah. column store. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. 3PAR was a feature company. Look what happened to 3PAR. But you've now, then you laid out a picture of the platform today. Yep. Um, but then hear John's story, people still buy in that feature. Yeah. So, um, but you've got some place to take them. So I wonder if you'd add some color to that sort of roadmap that you laid out. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point, Dave. So I still see certain uh, pictures that, that prospects will do, or well, they'll lay out a, a landscape and then they'll have a column store off in the corner. The reality is that a lot of the workloads that people are doing, a lot of the machine learning, a lot of the clickstream analytics, a lot of the things that um, are, are beyond just the type of product that's underlying, uh, everyone has that need. And so we've certainly brought in the, the columnar was our flagship. It's what we were known for in the beginning, but we were operating and still do under the premise that one size does not fit all. And we knew that if we created the right foundation, the right architecture, we built it from the ground up, we could then add on the right capabilities as opposed to I think a lot of competitors which are taking decades old technology that was never designed for the workloads that we have today 
and they're, they have a lot of functionality, but they can't figure out the scale and they can't figure out the performance, at least not economically. We figured that out first, and now through our partners, through our community ecosystem, and through the work we're doing ourselves broadly as HP, we're adding a lot more capabilities to it. So, um, well, the recent Wikibon big data survey, you probably saw some glimpses of it. One of the questions that struck me the most is, have you begun to take resources away from your traditional EDW toward Hadoop? And it's a huge percentage, like 90 plus percent of the people said yes, we either have or will by the end of the year. Um, and you guys are in the middle of that transition. You're yeah. not traditional EDW and you're not pure play Hadoop. Yeah. So what do you have to do to preserve and expand your total available market? I wonder if you could talk about that a little well, bit. Well, so there, there's, there's a lot of tech terms floating around that, that I think confuse the whole issue. You know, the early days of Hadoop were all about MapReduce. Mm -hmm. MapReduce is pretty much dead, it's gone. You know, they're now focused on Yarn, they're focused on workload management, and they're focused on databases, focused on SQL. Um, you know, still running a lot of other types of processing on Hadoop, but Hadoop itself has evolved. I think Hadoop itself is, has expanded the same way that Vertica has expanded. And there is absolutely a convergence, which is why it's always been part of our Haven platform. Uh, we see it at a lot of customers. But what we try to do, Dave, is we try to just focus on what is the customer trying to do? Is it a real-time interactive workload where you're going to want sub-second response times, or is it batch processing? Or is it some simple SQL that you're just going to look for a simple query to run, or are you going to do some complex work? Is it machine learning? Or And if we, if we understand that, then we guide our customers down the right path. And again, one size does not fit all. I think the reality of the market today is you need a little bit of this, a little bit of that, you know, throw in some of that, and so Let's talk about that reality about MapReduce. You mentioned MapReduce, you're kind of saying dead, but when I hear something's dead, I always go, whoa, something, <laughs> something's dead. I'm going to be a blogger in the room, because um, something's <laughs> always dead when you're writing a blog post. Yeah. Um, MapReduce is evolving, it's being either, it means dead or being abstracted away. It, yeah. Um, and and, and are, you, are you saying the industry's expanding their focus, or moving away from MapReduce? Well, I think part of what happened with MapReduce is um, you, you, know, you need to be a decent programmer to do it, and what we're hearing about at all these shows is there's such a shortage of people that know how to interact with data. And while programming is great, not many of us are able to do the programming. SQL, while it's not perfect, is at least a common or more common construct where you can use a declarative language to get at the data. I think that's certainly why you've seen the Hadoop community shift towards Hive, shift towards some of these other SQL-based solutions. So it's not that, you know, maybe MapReduce is dead is an overstatement, but if you look at those it's platforms, shift. it's more of it's a, a shift. It's a shift. And it's not the focal point anymore. It's not the that's focal point. Sure. And now you hear about Spark and you hear about all mm. these other things in and around the Hadoop world. And if you strip it back, it actually looks very similar to the platform that we've been building here as well. So I think there's a convergence, I think there's an opportunity for everyone, and you hit it on the head. I think the, the real folks that everyone's frustrated with is the traditional enterprise data warehouse. Mm -hmm. you know, they're sick of paying ridiculous amount of monies, trying to lock everything down into you know, one monolithic platform that takes months and months to load and process data. People want that instant access, you know, controlled access, but instant access to be able to monetize. Yeah, traditionally DW is just not working anymore. It's just not the, the fulfilling the vision. So yep. should we think of the core Hadoop infrastructure, the Apache Hadoop, the MapReduce underneath as sort of the substrate and the value gets built on top in analytics? You called it analytics 3.0. You yep. said log everything, analyze everything, infinite sample size, like minimal samples are dead essentially. There's another blog post for you, John. Um, segmentation of one, and then you said embed Data smarts. Yep. Um, so, two question, two part question. One is, is that where all the value is, and what do you mean by embed smarts in the data? Yeah. So the the embed smarts in the data is, if you look at a lot of software that's being designed now, and not just software, but automobiles, airplanes, mm -hmm. you name it, uh, even servers. And IT has actually been doing this for for the most amount of time. But we hear about Internet of Things. What's happening now is. Products and services are being designed not only as the product and service that's being delivered, but they're being designed in a way that they can actually manage information about that product and service to make it better. So think about a phone home capability, think about you're getting feedback about everything that's going on in a car, so that when you go into service the automobile, you've got all that sensor data there. Well, cars are being designed now knowing that engineers should put sensors everywhere and collect that information and, and send it back. 
that's what I mean by the, the embedded side. And to answer this, the other part of your question, I absolutely think the value is all in the data uh, above it. There's a substrate, there's platforms, there's a lot of value there. But what ultimately folks want is they want to they want the tangible patterns and value that can be extracted from that that they can use. The other stat I liked in your keynote, you, you talked about for every two orders of magnitude increase in the amount of data, there's essentially four orders of magnitude in terms of the number of patterns that you can analyze, assuming you got the brain power to analyze it. Furrier tweeted out your reference to the Wall Street Journal article this week in the Weekend Journal. Um, what, is a, what are HP Vertica doing to close that, that gap? Well, we're trying to, a lot of what we focus on is, and, and we do a lot of this work with HP Labs as well, but it's how do you not require a PhD to go in, look at the information, and actually derive the value out of it. And I think machine learning, uh, there's a reason why it's all the rage right now. We need to augment, and to a certain extent, automate some of what we do through the processing power in the computers to be able to deliver those insights. Now, it will never replace what humans can do from a human intelligence standpoint, but unfortunately, we as managers, we as people, practitioners, are getting inundated with information. So even if we can just help focus into a certain area um, of information and alleviate some of that work, then it, it makes everyone a lot more productive. Okay, we have a question from the crowd chat, which value. by the way, go to crowdchat.net slash HP Big Data 2014. We have a live crowd chat. This is our new innovation called the engagement container where we're containing all the conversation, recording it all to, and, and voting on it. But the question for Colin, <laughs> what's the reasoning behind saying Matt Produce is dead? Sounds like a fluff CEO statement. He used to be the, uh, the CEO of Vertica, uh, but now he's just a GM, which is like CEO like at HP. So that's the first thing he says. Yep. And he says, um, especially for non-RDMS data, I've always thought it insane that for decades, IT always attempted to shove everything in RD. BMS. Yeah, so, so the, two things, fluff this, statement versus the jamming everything into a relational database. Yeah, this is a good good statement. So while I, while I you know made the statement about MapReduce, I absolutely believe that all data should not just be in an RDBMS, right? There's a distinction. I think there's a lot of value to Hadoop, there's a lot of value to putting the information in there. There's value to the processing that you can do there, but the way that information is being processed on Hadoop today is dramatically different than the way it was being processed on Hadoop three, four, five years ago. So it's not an insult in any way to, to Hadoop. You know, we absolutely embrace that, but the, the core founding of what Hadoop started as, you know, Google moved away from MapReduce five years ago. Right, so they're they're long since gone from it. They're the ones that started it. So it's not a fluffy statement. If you uh, if you do some digging, you'll find it out there as well. Um, but I also don't believe that you you know you have to force everything into an RDBMS because it's just impractical. People don't want to structure information before they derive value from it, right? Nobody wants to be forced to do that, and so there's a lot of value to these alternative platforms. Final question, I know we got a break, we're getting the hook here, but I want to ask you, true or false statement, Vertica is a Ferrari of big data databases because of its performance. Is that a myth, is that positioning? I mean, we're seeing a lot of your, a lot of the high-end folks who have huge needs, obviously the big, you know, uh, the Facebooks of the world, the high-end customers, I mean, are all endorsing your product, so that's yep. a te good testament to the product. But is it the Ferrari, and do people know how to drive this thing, is, or is that true? Is that true? or you see it differently? Yeah, no, I definitely see it. I don't want to be accused of being the fluffy GM making the statement, but it, it's a Ferrari. It's, it's, it's very, very fast, uh, but it's more than speed. It, it, I think the one, the, 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 the one message that I convey to people all the time is yes, Vertic is fast. Yes, we have speeds and feeds and all that other stuff, but so much of our value is about the functionality too. It's about the analytics that you can do on the information combined with that speed that's what gets us to, uh, to where most of our customers really want to go. Do you worry people don't know how to drive the Ferrari? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, I, not only do I worry that they don't know how to drive the Ferrari, I'm not sure that people have encountered, you know, in, in, in the same context, an automobile quite like this. And it, it, this is actually more than a Ferrari, this is a massive freight truck, train, whatever you want to call it, that happens to go handle as fast as Just be careful you don't run over any of your competition. That's yeah. been a trend well, we've been seeing lately. That wouldn't be um, too bad. Okay, this is theCUBE, <laughs> we're here live in Boston. Uh, we'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Thank you.